and welcome everybody to this week's the first in the series 12 of maternity and midwifery hour welcome to everybody and my name is sue mcdonald and i am the curator of the maternity and midwifery festivals and maternity and midwifery hour which is this and i'm joined this evening by benish Benish, I hope I've got that correct this time, Nazmin and Julia Clark this evening. And because we always do this, for those of you who don't watch this normally, this is what we do. I ask them to share a moment of the week. So I'm going to start with Ben. I've got it wrong again, but Benish. 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 You, you said Benish. it right the first time. Ah. It's because it's not quite spelt the way it's said, which I should be used to, because there's plenty of English words that are not the same. Your moment of the week. My moment of the week was completing my 3,000 word assignment for my module and being like, oh, I can download some audio books now and have, <laughs> have a little break from writing. Fantastic. Well, that's a, what a wonderful time to start the year with that. Yes. When, when do you get the results? Well, submitting it tomorrow, so. <gasps> right. Okay. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much. How about Julia? I know you've got a special one too. Well, I have. I was going to tell you about my 22-month-old <gasps> asking to do a wee in the potty for the first time and actually doing it and then being so upset by it that he had to have a very serious cuddle to, to recover from the shock. But that's been trumped by the government today announcing 50 million for research to tackle maternity disparities. So I feel like that's probably my new moment of the week, although both very important in their own ways. Well, that's a personal and professional. That, I think that's fine. That's lovely, lovely place to start. And that's like normal life transposed with our other professional life so thank you so much okay well I'm just going to just go through what I usually do apart from being very excited because it's season 12 and we haven't been together for the last ooh, two or three weeks and I'm just going to remind people who are here and should know that anyway who've been coming on for ages and those of you who are new to the maternity midwifery hour we started in 2020 right at the beginning of the first lockdown for the COVID pandemic. And it was a way, because we couldn't have um, study days, conferences, and interaction with midwives, student midwives, and all the people who come to our festivals, we felt that we really needed something for those people to be able to interact to and get information. Because I, those of you who've been around for a little while, like four years, will remember it was a very scary time and we were all desperate for information, especially around COVID and in our own field in midwifery and maternity services. Very much we wanted to know what the implications were, how we could deal with it, how we could manage, how we could just survive it ourselves mentally as well as physically. So we started this and it's carried on. Of course, now COVID is a little bit more in the background. It's still around, but it's not the way it was. And, and we've kind of taken different topics now just to make sure people are up to date. And we've got a wonderful audience of you guys out there who join us every week. So welcome to all of you regular people. If you haven't accessed this before, welcome for the first time. And I need to tell you that everything we do at the Maternity Midwifery Forum is recorded. So if you miss anything, and if you have a, a crisis or an excitement at home and you don't get to finish today's presentation, you can access it later. Especially if you register for tonight, you'll get the, the whole um, session anyway. But if you go to Matflix, you can access a whole load of thousands of, of presentations anything you'd like to we've done, we've got there for you and if you can't find something you think we ought to have done it get get in touch and we might be able to put it on either in one of the festivals or in the maternity midwifery hour and we've got some lovely box sets which the lovely jenny hall dr jenny hall puts together which have the kind of focus they have lots of reflective activities and that sort of thing so you can access those if you have a small subscription or if you're subscribed through your institution which is fantastic and i ought to say you we love you to share so if you enjoy tonight which i know you will 
it's going it's going to be challenging and thought provoking but you're going to enjoy it um share with your colleagues and say what you've learned because that helps you stick it in the brain and start starts you thinking about how it really matters and how you can bring the things that you're going to learn tonight into your practice so do share now i'm going to say a big thank you to our midwives our student midwives our doulas and our maternity care support workers all the people who are keeping the maternity services going I'm always saying this, but it's, it always seems to be right that it's a very stressful time. There's not enough of us. We're having to work very hard and it's cold as well, I've noticed. And that makes it harder. Everything's a bit more of an effort. So thank you for all the things you're doing. And I really mean that very sincerely. But do look after yourselves because you are as important as the people you're looking after. And that's that's you must know that. Now, I've just got a little bit of news well, there's quite a little bit of news, but I'll have to keep it short. I'm going to say a big happy birthday to Professor Leslie Page because it's her birthday tomorrow. And I don't know if she wants to kept a secret, but it's not a secret. Happy birthday, Leslie. Now, hot off the press is the Embrace report. This report we're going to be talking about this, this evening. So I'm not going to have to talk about it because my two lovely guests are going to do that for me, which is fantastic. Um, and I know that Julia was saying about the, the a new announcement from about the, the women's health strategy, and that is available um, on the resource list. And this she was talking about better care for gynecological and menstrual problems, all the stuff around uh, menopause and, and most importantly, putting some cash into research. And I know that was very close to Julia's heart and um, also Benish's heart too. So that's really good. Lots of talk about health hubs, very, and it's it's kind of work in progress, if you like, but also very important, this issue of tackling disparities and improving support for vulnerable women, women including those who've gone through sexual abuse, but also what we'll be discussing this evening. And it reminded one of one comment was made about the three year delivery plan. And if you haven't read it, you need to get hold of it. And it's available online. I think I put that on the list of resources. If I hadn't, I'll, I'll put it on for next week anyway. Um, OK, and this the other thing that you need to know about is this week the launch of a parliamentary inquiry into birth trauma. And that's uh, for, via the APPG. And again, the link is on the resource sheet. And it's an important piece of work that's going to go on. They're calling for evidence from women uh, and families to put in to help them work on this. So it's worth going in for this now. So this week, I'm just checking my timing because I don't want you to miss a moment of the session. So we're going to be looking at the needs and experience of a black and Asian women going through stillbirth and perinatal death. And this is in relation to um, the Embrace, two Embrace reports. It starts off as one, but I may be wrong, but I think it's turned into two now. I know it's two, but I thought it started as one. And I have to say, it is really important reading. And it's full of the usual. Embrace do some fantastic presentations and superb infographics, which are really digestible and really memorable. They really stick in your mind. So I will really recommend that you have a look at the reports, have a look at the women's experiences and stories, really important. So we're also going to talk about the SANS listing project, which is kind of complementary. Um, and we'll, it, it, so these are of the press. I'm really excited to hear about it. Anyway, I'm going. I'm delighted to welcome Bini, Bin, Binish. I'm hopeless Benish, who is an associate assistant professor in midwifery at the University of Bradford. She's also a co-director of the Assam Midwives. Uh, we've invited before for tea and tea and chai. Or chai and chat, I think. Now, you see, this is a long time ago, but that was a fantastic session. She's a practicing midwife. She's got a special interest in addressing health inequalities and breaking down barriers to care through empowering others. She's moved around a lot in her professional life from Bradford, Sheffield, Nottingham and Bolton and a short stint in the U. AE. She's also on the editorial board, editorial board for the Practicing Midwife magazine. 
She's a midwifery ambassador for NHS England, and she was honoured with a Royal College of Midwives Fellowship in March 2022. And she's passionate about continuity of care. And I like this bit, especially, and I know for those who looked online, you'll know this, passionate about continuity of care and in medicalizing birth. She was born in the mountains of Kashmir under the watchful eyes of the midwife, the village midwife, her grandmother. And isn't that wonderful? I just love that. Binish. I love that. So welcome. You the screen is now yours. Thank you so much for welcoming me, um, Sue. And it is Binish, you were right. You kept correcting yourself, but it is Binish. <laughs> um but I mean I, I welcome all abbreviation uh, abbreviations. <laughs> um my name uh is what my grandma gave me, my sister and my grandma. Wow. Um, and it means one with foresight and intelligence. Now, some would debate against that. Some may argue for it, but I I'm all for both. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for a, a lovely invite and a welcome. I'm just going to do that typical thing where I say, bear with me one moment while <laughs> I share my screen, everybody. Um, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here and to, um, to, to come and talk about something that's really close to my heart. That's something that, you, you know, it's something we've been talking about and we've had conversations around health and equality in maternity care historically on Netflix um, and most recently um, coming to review the most recent Embrace uh, 2023 report that came out in December uh, which was two reports um, it initially started off at looking at black um, babies and, and perinatal outcomes for black babies um, and then it, it was further commissioned to be able to look at Asian uh, outcomes as well. And this was in comparison to white counterparts. So you will find there's two separate reports and there's two separate findings. So uh, perinatal outcomes for black babies in comparison to white counterparts. And again, for Asian babies in comparison to white counterparts. I'm going to talk a little bit about both and then give some thoughts and bring out some key points. Um, I was part of the panel that was reviewing this documentation, so I'll bring some insights um, along the way too. So the report um, highlighted the increased risk of stillbirth and neonatal mortality rates for our Black and Asian communities in comparison to their white counterparts. Um, if we look at some of the statistics there, I'm, I'm not going to repeat them. You can see them on the screen quite clearly. Um, but the increased risk, so our black Asian babies are at higher risk, are at the highest risk actually of um, uh, having stillbirths or uh, loss. And that's at 124%. This, uh, the highest community, if we break it down by ethnicity, was at uh, Black African, um, and this was despite um, counting for economic deprivation as well. Um, and then if we look at the Asian outcomes, again, it was um, our neonatal deaths uh, were higher for our Asian babies, uh, with our Asian Pakistani communities at 59% more likely to, to have neonatal deaths. So this is the stillbirth rates um and again the, the counting it was accounting for um just got myself all found about my moment the neonatal death rates and it again counted for socioeconomic deprivation as well so these were some of the statistics that came out earlier on the in detail report we're looking at um antenatal care issues were highlighted that both black and asian women um antenatal care issues were identified at higher rates that could have improved the outcomes. Um, there was um, also some challenges specifically for our Black families, um, women and individuals who are accessing maternity care in regards to access, um, prescription to medications, um, increased uh, possible lack of engagement um, and missing specialist uh, appointments for our Asian communities, there was a higher risk of patho uh, pathology um, issues, for example, um, not having post-mortem um, after the death, which we know has, um, has can give us answers. Um, and there are, there are some conversations we'll, which we can bring up later around this. So these were some of the outcomes highlighted. 
Um, in reality, there's a lot more in the reports and I'm not bringing uh, in the specific infographics you mentioned, Sue, because I want people to go and look at the reports. I think it's really important that if you're a midwife, um, that you look at the reports and those infographics and, and consider how this falls in line with your role and, and where you work um, and how that might impact um, the way you work. But some of the key points that I personally um, felt that I wanted to discuss today were the fact that Black and Asian mothers um, were having good care, but fewer episodes than their white counterparts overall. So what, what is good care and how does that look? It was reviewed all the way through from antenatal, birth, postnatal and bereavement follow-up as well, including um, follow-up debriefs after loss. So the whole journey was reviewed and episodes of good care overall uh, were fewer for our Black and Asian communities. What this might mean and how this is reflected um, is something that we need to consider in our roles what is happening in our jobs that we are not able to uh, communicate I think one of the issues that came over and over again was um, the follow-up letter after a loss that sent to GPs about what has happened information sharing the information is directly talking to the GP despite this being the same letter that is received by members of the family. So it's talking very medicalized term, it's not very friendly, and it's also not addressing the person who we're talking about, and that's that family. So considering how this might be improved, I know this has been highlighted previously, it's something that um, we need to think about in regards to future engagement or possible impact it might be having on disengagement the other issues that were highlighted were the lack of or in a, inadequate use of interpretation services when there are language barriers at present. Um, again, a conversation we've had over and over again. A lot of the time we have systems that have uh, changed and evolved, but after initially bringing in um, services or equipment into uh, practice, we don't necessarily always have adequate follow-up and updates in training, updates on how to use services, updates on how to address concerns we might have, and active auditing in how effective that service or that equipment is. Generally, we audit everything we do. So why is our a key instrument that we need to communicate not being audited? Because um, if it's not fit for purpose, then we need to address it. Or if, if it's training that we need, then that needs to be incorporated in. As you can see here, those with the most language barriers were Asian women. Um, I think it fell into the Asian category overall with Asian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi women um, having higher rates of needs for interpreters. Social risk factors were being recorded as present, uh, recorded as less for Asian women. Um, and that's inconsistent with I. Um, the identification and referral processes across uh, both groups. So we were recognizing and better at recognizing social risk factors and need for support for the white counterpart, but not necessarily so for Asian women in communities. Is this because there's uh, a lack of communication? Is this because there's fear of disclosure? Uh, we talk about continuity of care and how important continuity of care is building relationship, building trust, and being able to disclose social risk factors. Or is this the fact that we're not able to necessarily recognise it because it's something we are looking for factors that are Eurocentric and maybe someone's presenting in a different way due to culture or disclosing something in a different manner using different terminology which we're unfamiliar with. Um, uptake of antenatal screening for chromosomal conditions was lower in Asian communities with a higher percentage of dec uh, you know declining for screening um, in comparison to our white counterparts now again is this a communication issue we know um some of our communities are having higher rates of chromosomal or genomics genetics uh, needs um so working with our communities co-producing the services um to make sure that they're adequate for the needs of those communities 
so they are sensitive and we're able to broach them may help us address some of these concerns uh, because it may impact future pregnancies. We know that people who have losses are likely to come back and have future pregnancies. Um, having the preconception care and support is really important here. Poor recognition of personal challenges, which is especially true for um, some of our white counterparts and white women that we review documentation for. I always think that, yes, we've been talking and highlighting how uh, recording um, ethnicity is vital and important in everything we do. Uh, but I remember when I was working clinically um, and I tried to make a change in the system to recognize our traveler gypsy Roma communities, uh, Eastern European communities, because they are also marginalized groups. They also have barriers to access. Um, antenatally we inputted it so the system had to uh, so that uh, midwives could pick up that information and put it in and we could hopefully follow their outcomes however at the time of birth the spine at nhs england would recognize that because it didn't translate so at the time of birth it would revert back to white or white other which means they their outcomes became diluted into this larger pool of uh of larger pool of data so really, we don't know what's happening there. And um, I suspect, but I cannot confirm with the data, that this is something that is um, from our marginalised white communities that are, we are seeing there that's not being recognised and not being addressed. Um, we, we saw um, the fact that there was fewer blood tests offered for gestational diabetes for black and Asian women. Um, and actually, commencement of vitamin D, there was no commencement for black women, even though we know that... Um, the more melanin you have in your skin, the less likely, to, the more likely you, you are to be vitamin D deficient. And only one in 10 Asian women were being commenced in vitamin D. Vitamin D is important for everyone, everyone's health, in your long-term health, in your quality of life. It's also really important pregnancy when you're growing a little human um, and, and their bones and their development and their future development as well. So really vital things that are not happening and um, we've mentioned this before, but I just really, really wanted to reiterate that access and the barriers to accessing that we identified for black women um, and the, the lack of personalised care was recognised too. So these are my thoughts and what's come up for me from being on the receiving end and looking at it from, uh, from the report as a final product, but also being on the other side and having been part of the process for this specific report uh, for perinatal outcomes, I, I feel like it's really important to talk about the iceberg. And, and actually what we are seeing is the very, very tip. And I thought when I started this, that it'd be so, um, you know, it, I'd be able to look at the data and find the answers because I really like to pick up data and try to unpick to understand what's happening behind the scenes. But unfortunately, the reality is the data we have is what we document. And we know a lot of things we do not document because we do not have the capacity to, or the systems do not allow it. We are going technological. And some of the things are that the IT data and the digital data that was coming in was either insufficient or not being documented to the full, in, the full effect as if someone was handwriting. I know that if I'm handwriting, I can write, write and write and write. And I was one of those midwives. I would write essays. Oh God, that's flashback to essays earlier in the week that I was writing. But yeah, I can write essays. However, if I'm typing something, I'm likely to write less. So what are we missing out in that data? Also, what we document is what is being done, what is being, uh, what is accepted, what is declined, but not necessarily the conversations and the nuanced, um, the, the the nuances of that conversation, the nonverbal, the the possible, um, the possible things that are make are giving us an idea of what's actually happening. Um, so we can't really unpick that. So we can get outcomes, we can get data. It's being shared, it's being disseminated. We can see what complaints are coming out in the media, in the articles. We can see the complaints that might be uh, coming out through um, our uh, PALS complaints procedures. But who's more likely to complain? When I worked, when I looked at the local data in the previous trust I worked at, uh, even though 
our um, Asian community in that in, in that locality uh, was thirty percent. Less than one percent of the complaints were from the Asian community. So really, our communities are less likely to complain. Um, and then the documentation is what we're looking at that helps us get a little bit of that understanding. But the lived experience isn't there. If people have disengaged, we don't understand why they've disengaged. And ultimately, we know what the data says about years of ill health comparison versus, um, you know, on average, it can be 7.5 years of your life expectancy that can differ from you if you're living in a socioeconomically deprived area versus an affluent area we know that if you're living in those same areas and you're black or asian you're likely to have higher rates so you're more likely to have lower years of ill health in comparison to your white neighbor so what you know what is what is that data really saying to us and how are we unpicking it and what are we finding out the limitations of the study was that we need to find the other side we need to hear the voices and I'm so glad Julia's here to follow up with those voices and tell us those those experiences that can directly give us some improvement but also as as a midwife as someone who's passionate and as someone who's had these conversations over and over again I would encourage you to go and look at the report look at the recommendations that have been made in the report look at if you are a researcher and want to do research in this look at the gaps so that we can start to understand the nuance behind it and start to address that and ultimately when we are practicing it is us as a professional with someone who needs our services there is a power dynamic there unfortunately we might not think it's there we might not treat it like it's there we wear a uniform most of the time. We are a person of authority. So the reality is someone may have experienced something before us that's made them less likely to trust us as a healthcare professional. Or someone's heard or uh, heard something that's not been great, or they culturally are less likely to be able to engage because of the way they socialize, the way they've been brought up and it takes time to build. So when you're providing care, do that extra little bit. And I know it's really hard to do, and I know you're doing everything you can do right now, but something's not happening really well for our communities at the moment. And as someone from a South Asian community who um, who knows that I've had people come up to me what, as soon as they know that I'm a midwife just to share their experiences with me when I ask them back about have did you complain or did you raise this or did you tell your midwife they say no because they don't feel like they were able to so ultimately we don't know what we don't know but how we approach each conversation and how we appear each time means that the person in front of us will or will engage with us so just being reflective in our practice being sure that we're offering all options, being sh being sure that people are giving the pros and cons, and we are not, uh, you know, if we think of Montgomery v. Lanarkshire, we need to give those options for people to make the decisions they need to make that's right for them. And when we're not giving it, we are going to be impacting someone's health and their outcomes, unfortunately. So... <clears throat> Okay, I'll stop talking there. Um, I'll have a little breather. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. I'm sure we're going to have some conversations later. So I'm just going to stop sharing and hand over and hopefully speak to you on the other side. <laughs> that sounds quite spooky, Binesh. <laughs> but thank you so much that, that you've you've i hope that the people who are watching are thinking now we've got to go and have a look at this report it's all available online so you don't have to buy some thick report it's all available for you and the links are there so thank you so much for raising the kind of the starting the debate and getting us to think about the sort of things and that are important and what we need to be aware of Without almost without a little gap, I'm moving on now to our next speaker, who's Julia 
Clark, who is a registered midwife. She has a PhD in health sciences and her research interests include stillbirth prevention, risk reduction work, informed choice and inequalities and rights in maternity care. And she currently works as a research officer as part of the SANS Saving Babies Lives teams. And she's going to be talking about the SANS Listening Project, which really complements what Benicia has been talking about. So welcome, Julia. The screen is now yours. Lovely. I will get across to it. It's lovely to be here with Benish today, who I am fortunate to know from work in Sheffield. My CV always sounds slightly thin compared to hers, but I don't think I have as many hours in the day. <laughs> Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, it says it's showing. No. That's... No. Okay, I, I went into it through my screen share. Let's try this one. This is the wonder of modern technology. Sorry, Sorry everyone. <laughs> no okay. worries. There we go. Brilliant. Is it there? Excellent. Hello, everyone. I can see you all again as well. That's nice. <laughs> so um, thank you for my introduction, Sue. In addition to the bits that Sue's already mentioned, I've also worked as a maternity advocate and I, I was assistant professor in midwifery at the University of Nottingham, where um, I focus on the politics of maternity care. It's really lovely to be here with you today. So I was part of a team who worked on the SANS listening project, which was about learning from the experiences of black and Asian bereaved parents. I've been chosen to speak to you today just because we all thought it'd be nice for me to share what we've learned with a midwifery a student midwife maternity worker audience. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I do have to share a content warning at the start. So as you would expect, I will be talking about some things that it can be very difficult to hear about, including racism, pregnancy loss, and the death of a baby. So please do take care of yourselves. And if you need to step away, please do. You can come back to this later and, and revisit the recording. And the SANS National Helpline is there for anyone who's been affected by the death of a baby. And that does include healthcare professionals for as long as that support is needed. So just in case some of you aren't so familiar with SANS work, I just wanted to share, first of all, our vision. So our vision is for a world where fewer babies die. And when a baby does die, anyone affected receives the best possible care and support for as long as it's needed. And that ties into two core aims, the saving babies' lives and ensuring that anyone affected by the death of a baby receives the care and support they need. And really, this project ties clearly into this first aim. Reducing inequalities in baby loss is absolutely essential if we are to save more babies' lives. Before I go into the study, I just wanted to share this, this one quote, which was a mother's reflections on why this particular kind of work is still needed. She told us there's just a general lack of understanding still after the generations and generations of people giving birth, that it doesn't look the same for everybody. Clearly, the perspectives of Black and Asian bereaved parents are critical opportunities to learn about how to make care safer and more equitable. And, you know, as, as Beanish mentioned in the last presentation, it's those perspectives that couldn't be captured in Embrace Confidential Inquiries and which we're really pleased to be able to share with you today. The nice thing about following Beanish is that a lot of the work in setting the background has been done for me. Um, you know, as we've discussed, the rates of pregnancy loss and baby death are higher in the UK among black and Asian babies compared with white babies. This has been the case for some time now, and we've seen little progress in addressing this. Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen these inequalities represented in lots of different ways, different numbers over time. The one statistic I wanted to share with you today is this one, because I think it really highlights, it drives home why this is so important. If between 2017 and 2021, stillbirth and neonatal death rates for black and Asian babies had been the same as for white babies, 1,704 babies would have survived. So we know 
everyone listening, I'm sure, knows that an individual's personal risk of their baby dying could depend on many different complicated factors. But we also have to be to be honest and acknowledge that systemic issues, that the quality of care can contribute. And a number of reports now from groups like Birthrights, the Muslim Women's Network, five times more, have shown that racism is a factor for many families affecting their experiences of maternity care. So moving on then to how we listened to parents. So we wanted to hear directly from Black and Asian bereaved parents about their experiences of maternity, postnatal, neonatal, and bereavement care. So the full spectrum of care. And when we were setting this project up, we collaborated with a range of stakeholder groups and community representatives to engage with families from Black and Asian backgrounds. We were really pleased to hear from 56 parents in total, four to seven mothers and nine fathers. And, and these were um, bereaved parents whose babies had died at any stage in pregnancy or within 28 days of the birth since 2016. Um, and you can find more information about parents' characteristics in the reports as a breakdown of, of different um, the different ethnic groups, their experiences of loss, and, and a few other things where in the country they were from, for example. Um, I'm not going to go into the methods in any great detail, but we try to be as um, make it as easy as possible to take part in this research. So we did interviews but we did them over the phone, we did them on Zoom, we did them through email, and we brought that in in response to, to a, a need that was identified in the project. And we did them through WhatsApp voice notes. And any researchers out there, if you've not used WhatsApp voice notes, I hadn't. It turned out to be a really useful way to have kind of quite rambling discussions with, with quite busy people. Um, and it was it really felt quite personal. We also did focus groups, um, one in person and four online. And throughout all of this work, it's really important to, to acknowledge the contributions of our project involvement group, which was a collaboration of bereaved parents and specialist sans bereavement staff from Black and Asian backgrounds. And their contributions really helped us make sure we went about this work in a sensitive and appropriate way. So we heard a range of experiences spanning preconception through pregnancy, through to postnatal um, experiences, neonatal care, bereavement care. And, and here I'm going to be discussing these findings, and this is how they're also presented in the report under four key themes. So being listened to and heard, personalized joined up care, communication about safety and risk and safety and learning. And that really relates to learning after a baby has died. Um, and all of these areas have been highlighted in policy recommendations as being absolutely fundamental to safe care. And I don't think there would be any surprises there um, for those of you listening today. Before I go into a little more detail, I do want to um, acknowledge that we did, as part of this project, hear some very positive experiences of care too. We heard midwives and doctors described in glowing terms. We heard about great connections. We heard particularly positive um, accounts of bereavement care, and we will be sharing more of um, more of what parents told us in other outputs. But our initial presentation and today's um, sorry, our initial report and today's presentation was really focused on learning from those experiences where care could have been improved. So a striking finding to start with is that half of the parents who spoke to us believed that they had received worse care or were treated differently because of their ethnicity. And equally important, there was a group of parents who said they were unsure if they had been treated differently because of their ethnicity. And what this meant was that as they shared their story with us, perhaps months, perhaps years after their baby or babies had died, they still were left wondering whether their ethnicity had been a factor in, in their baby's death and they couldn't rule it out. So under the theme of being listened to and heard, more than half of the parents told us that they felt that healthcare professionals hadn't listened when they'd raised concerns. And of these, some linked it to racism or stereotyping. And we also heard that limited contact with care providers and unclear care pathways, especially in early pregnancy, and that was quite striking, made it hard for some parents to know where to go 
um, to share their concerns in order to have them heard. And, and this has clear safety implications. You know, we heard about important warning signs being missed. We heard about parents who didn't get the right investigations or care in time. Opportunities to save lives were sadly missed. And over time, parents described how this kind of response, when they had, you know, they'd done their bit in coming forward and, and not been listened to, it led to poor relationships, which put parents off reporting concerns in the future. And, and I have to say, as someone who'd worked in advocacy, it was very uncomfortable to listen to some of these experiences where parents were absolutely doing their part in sharing their concerns, which you know, I'm sure many of us have been involved in encouraging parents to do that. And you can imagine how powerless many of them felt, how distressing it was when despite them doing that, they still didn't have the care that they knew they were entitled to. But we also heard how stereotyping linked to ethnicity meant that sometimes parents were not listened to. So a number of black or uh, mixed white and black mothers described being stereotyped as strong or dramatic. And these are the words that, that they used and healthcare professionals not recognizing when they were at their most vulnerable. And I know other, other reports have found similar things. Like this quote is a really moving one and captures this so well. So this mother told us, I think they just could not recognize in me actual fear. They just saw this feisty, strong brown woman. And actually I was so scared I couldn't speak. I was just like blank. And they kept saying stuff like, you're so brave. You're doing so well, you're so brave. And I just thought you haven't even asked me if I'm okay. Because if you had asked me, you would know that I'm not okay. And that this is not bravery, this is fear. And I think quotes like this can be very uncomfortable to hear as, as midwives because we, we have to wonder when perhaps we've said things like that to people wanting to make them feel better. And, and this just gets us to start reflecting about what we might not be seeing, I think. The Asian parents also shared experiences of harmful stereotyping, for example, being referred to as princesses to imply they were overly anxious or prone to making a fuss which could lead to their worries being dismissed. And actually one mother um, raised the point, I think that Beanish mentioned in her presentation that actually, um, you know, this mother said as, a, as an Asian woman, she'd actually been raised, raised not to complain very much. So for her to make a complaint really required an awful lot. And she thought people should be aware of this. So completely counter to the stereotype that, that this mother and others described experiencing. And another mo mother and told us about um, her partner, who had seen a midwife rolling her eyes when the mother was expressing severe pain and pleading for help, um, something that he interpreted when he saw it as to imply she was making a fuss. And in fact, her, her uterus was rupturing and her baby was stillborn shortly afterwards. So these kind of experiences stay with parents. Under personalised joined up care, we heard about poorly coordinated care involving many staff, which led to delays and errors. We also heard about how hostile attitudes and stereotyping could make it harder to develop trusting relationships, especially within that system. So the safety implications of this, parents can be lost in a messy system. Um, there was information that was missed, misdocumented, not communicated across teams, signs and symptoms weren't recognized. There was errors in risk management, um, assessment, sorry. And again, delays in or failures to provide the right care. And it was very clear that in an already fragmented system, and, and I'm sure you will have all experienced this in your work, um, parents are having to make relationships again and again, not everywhere, but in a lot of areas. And this quote really captures a view that some parents shared, that the views that professionals might hold about people from their religious or ethnic group could be an additional barrier when trying to build and rebuild and rebuild trusting relationships. But this mother told us every time I've had a new midwife through my pregnancies, the initial kind of meeting always feels a bit weird because of being an ethnic minority and also Muslim and the way I dress. But then once that initial ice is broken and people understand like, no, I can, you know, communicate, I can like pass my message across. Once that initial kind of thing is over, then it's OK. On the topic of communication and safety and risk, 
So many parents felt that they didn't get the information they needed about safety and risk, including relating to ethnicity um, and how that may be a risk factor for certain conditions or for perinatal loss. And some parents describe feeling very anxious when their ethnicity was raised as a risk factor, but didn't, in their experience, lead to any improved or extra care. Um, so we, we heard that parents didn't have the information they needed to stay safe and raise concerns. Some were very confused about what level of care they should actually be receiving. And I think, again, coming back to the point that Beanish made, if parents don't get personalised information, if there's not enough rationale so that information isn't trusted, then parents may decline recommended care because of a lack of trust or information rather than through truly informed choice. There was also some evidence that an awareness of increased risks of pregnancy and baby loss linked to ethnicity could lead to dismissive attitudes in some healthcare professionals. And this was a comment made to um, a mother when she was on the postnatal ward shortly after her baby had died. And I've been told, like when I had the stillbirth, oh, it's common in black people, stillborns. Some Asian mothers described similar attitudes. One described how her GP had, and again, I'm using her, her language, had brushed off her miscarriages as one of those things, telling her that women of her ethnicity were prone to it and to expect it and keep trying. I think these kind of experiences raise really troubling questions about the effects of raising awareness of ethnicity as a potential risk factor um, among healthcare professionals and families, but not offering anything to make families feel safer. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that ethnicity is raised as a, a risk factor to be aware of in guidance, but we don't then have specific guidance about what to do with that information is something that we need to think quite hard about. And the final theme, safety and learning. So a lot of parents did not want to be a part of reviews or investigations. And I won't say much about that because I think Beanish has already explained why that is. But, you know, in, in brief, where someone has not developed trusting relationships in the antenatal period before their baby died, they might have little reason to trust that people now have their best interests at heart after their baby has died. Um, those that had taken part, many of them described negative experiences um, linked to very complex processes, errors and delays, poor communication, and sadly, um, a lack of candor, um, honesty and support that took too long. The process was too hard to understand. And, and really this feeling like no one was listening before. Why should I have to fight to be heard all over again? And, and, and doing that when you are grieving and um, processing some very difficult experiences. So, you know, and trying to pull all this together, the implications of this, poor experiences mean that Black and Asian families may not want to be involved, but their voices are then missing from reviews, they're missing from the findings, they're missing from safety initiatives, so we're not getting the full story, which means that, that the same problems will persist. And I think when we consider this sense of not being heard at this stage, along with the fact that so many parents are telling us they don't feel heard in their care before their baby dies, then this can start to explain, and I say this sort of tentatively, you know, it's, it's one explanation for why this gap isn't closing and inequalities are so persistent. So, and this particular quote touches on so many of the themes we've already discussed. This was a mother who had a terrible experience of care after previously experiencing um, a baby that was born very small, um, and then she had a stillbirth. And then in her next pregnancy, she um, she had significant concerns about her baby's movement. And it was linked to anxiety to the extent that she was told that she would be referred to a vulnerable women's midwife if she didn't stop coming in with fetal movement concerns until she, she burst into tears and on the floor and a midwife stepped in and reviewed everything again. And they discovered that her baby was not well and her baby was born very small and compromised a day later, but thankfully alive by emergency caesarean section. And when we asked this mother whether she would complain about what had happened, she told us, where is my proof? What am I going to say? How do I raise it? And again, it's about bringing up something that 
I've had a horrible, life-changing experience, quite traumatic. But then it's like fighting, isn't it? It's like fighting. It's like fighting for something that no one's going to believe. And finally, some parents described how it was not enough for them, for healthcare professionals to learn from their experience. One mother said to us, my baby didn't die so you could learn something. But they wanted to see clear accountability, apologies and change so that other families would not have to experience what they had. So what needs to change? Um, I Please do have a look at the report. There are more details in the report about specific actions that the government, professional bodies and regulators can take. Um, one of the recommendations was um, a commitment to fund research into addressing inequalities in maternity care, which is why today's announcement is, is so exciting. We really do at SANS acknowledge the immense pressure that maternity staff are currently working under. We know that this work is not easy. And, and as I said, while the stories I've shared today are those where care needed to be improved, we did hear some very moving examples of positive care, positive experiences. But we know that staff now need to be supported to, to have the time and the knowledge and the skills to listen to parents. Care needs to be structured to allow good communication, you need to be able to conduct detailed, personalised risk assessments and, and, you know, staff need to be supported to support parents to contribute to reviews and investigations. We've got no doubt that that is what maternity staff would like to be doing, but you now need the support that allows you to do that work. Closing words, I'm just going to leave to some of the parents who took part in this project, you know, their experiences, their babies who have died are at the heart of this project. And this, this is just parents sharing their reasons for wanting to take part. I'll read one aloud as a mother whose baby died at 12 weeks. And she just said, I'm hoping obviously that this will all feed into something a bit bigger. Hopefully people will pay attention to that. And then in the future, other people will have better experiences. I've gone far over my time. So thank you very much. The report's available there. Um, SANS can support you. Visit our website. Um, thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you so much, Julia. And thank you, Beanish. <laughs> thank you, both of you. I, mean, I think that's given us a huge amount of information and some pointers and quite a lot of questions it, it, which should be kind of rattling around in our brains. I mean, it, we have got some questions from the audience. Our audience are second to none with questions. Um, I've got, I mean, I've got a few in my mind as well, because especially thinking about some of the cultural sen insensitivity and cultural non-awareness, I'm kind of, I, I'm finding quite difficult to feel how come we how can we address this in real ways not just for student midwives because possibly i'm, I'm, I'm sure I, i'm fairly sure now that the, the curriculums now are planned much better to reflect cultural awareness cultural sensitivity and, and kind of a better it's like putting yourself in someone else's shoes and that sort of thing but it, it's thinking about how can we help other practitioners get a better understanding and it's not just midwives because it's from from what you've both been saying it's not just midwives it's the whole maternity service that needs to be much more aware and sensitive i'm not sure if if that if, if that's very thought thought through question to throw at either of you i don't know if you'd, you'd want to answer that i Beanish. think Beanish has a lot of experience <laughs> yes. on educating yes i'm aware of that Finish. I don't know if you want to sort of comment on that. Yeah, I, um, so I run cultural safety and competency workshops um, and we have to sell it as cultural competency because um, it's what people will invest in. But uh, the reality is we need to be culturally safe practitioners, which means uh, we need to feel safe as well. And safety means you're taking away power imbalance. It means you're being sensitive both ways and um, we are able to have conversations that we fear having um, because you know we don't know how to say the right thing or we are afraid of getting things wrong or doing something wrong 
and actually fear is what is a really big barrier mm. so um, a lot of cultural safety competency general workshops are focused on a tick box exercise and you can e-learn and tick 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 through a lot of things um what we do is focused on values clarification clarification actually true transformation so it's an engaging process of understanding how our values work and if they align with our behaviors and why that may or may not be and then looking how we can address that and, and start bringing that into practice. And the reality is that takes time, that takes safe spaces, that takes people with experience to facilitate these conversations, and it really mm. takes emotional work and labour. And, um, you know, we currently run the Vibe Lifeline, but uh, Julia's been to one of them, so I'll let Julia tell you really her experience of, of it. But the reality is, these conversations need to be had in a safe space mm. and uh, opportunities need to for growth need to happen. And currently the pressures in the systems don't allow for that. Mm. And investment doesn't allow for that. Mm. And it's not necessarily a priority. And yet think about the, the money we'd save if we were just a bit more culturally sensitive. I don't know, Julia, do you want to comment on? I, I suppose, you know, I, I took part in a very early form of the training that, finished describing and I remember it being very uncomfortable um, mm. because some of the case studies we looked at were case studies that I think if we're honest any of us could imagine being a small part of that jigsaw however good our intentions because of of the way the system's set up because of preconceptions that we hold um, and I, I don't think I would I mean it's been a long journey since then but I don't think I would be doing this kind of work if I hadn't stepped into that kind of space with Beanish a long time ago I've only made that connection now but wow. it does feel like there's been a long a long Beanish, journey Beanish well done <laughs> yeah, fabulous um, but I, I think we have to be willing to be uncomfortable mm. um, and it's very natural not to want to be uncomfortable and mm. to want to feel that we wouldn't do that kind of thing because we know we're, we're good people and we have people's best interests, interests at heart but we have to get into that uncomfortable space if change is going to happen no, I think you're absolutely right. And it, it's not help. I mean, it's an uncomfortable process and you need someone very skilled to support you through it and make you not feel just terribly guilty for the years of thing, the mistakes you've made, but to see forward the better practitioner you become. Maybe. Anyway, I'm going to let someone else question because we have Daniela Adelusi. Hi, Daniela. Welcome. And she says, have you got any recommendations on how students can get involved in this research? Mm, I think this might be one for you, Julia. Maybe. Maybe so, um, so this particular project, we one of the next steps we're doing is putting together some case studies with actual recordings from the interview so you can hear parents' voices firsthand because we know that's much more impactful and we've mm. we've got extra permission to do that for some and I'm hoping that these will be a resource we are going to sort of fit them on our website but I think that's the kind of thing that I hope people will start using with students as a way to reflect on some of the themes that come through um, in terms of being a researcher if that's the question um, that's a that's a long that's a long it's a long conversation and do feel free to send me an email at research at sands because i'm always happy to talk to midwives with an interest in research about the different ways to get involved in in different research projects i think oh. Beanish, i don't know about you but it, they weren't conversations i had early on or if they were i wasn't ready to listen <laughs> um so. i think um i will just go from this perspective actually any single person out there right now who's working in health can, can become a researcher because if you audit and you put a quality improvement project forward, um, you can start looking at the data, what's happening locally in your trust, start trying to understand what's happening and then what are the gaps, what don't we know and how you start to present that and share that learning is really important. I know it might be too late for some people, but it doesn't mean that it stops it, it, it won't make a difference for someone else in the future and as a student you can very well get involved in that so think of what you don't audit what you don't look at and start looking at how you can propose to do that fantastic that's a fantastic idea and, it, and of course a group of students could do a bit of an audit together as well this might do, do a good dissertation piece or something just thinking 
Okay. My thoughts exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. Well, I have a comment from Lola Onato. Hi, Lola, who says, good point about documentation, Beanish. Also, technology and systems that don't allow you free text is a huge problem. And I think there's a little bit of a discussion because I think another comment from Kirsty who says, I have mixed feelings on moving away from paper documentation. I'm definitely documenting less. But what that means is that I'm being with women more. As long as you're not missing out putting things down, I guess, because that that does seem to be a kind of issue that comes through in a lot of these reports. That there's often missing bits, bits of information, and that's becomes really important when you're looking back at something. And then we've got another comment from Lola, back to Lola, saying, honestly speaking, paper documentation did not take me away from being with women. I made it work. I definitely feel in labour settings, it's a lot more personal discreetly documenting the notes than having the glare of the computer and tapping of the keyboard. Okay, that's fabulous. I've got another question from Juliet Samuel in Essex. Hi, Juliet, who says, welcome back. Um, do you think the orientation of personalised care will impact on outcomes for these groups of women and will it be evidenced in future research? Well, that's a that's quite a big question, Juliet. I don't know. Should we just start with Beanish? Um, I think personalised care improves outcome for all if we do it properly, and we are supported to do it properly, and the systems allow for us to do it properly. Um, I think the changes that we make from the most marginalised groups impacts care for everybody. Um, and I, I go back and I will use this example over and over again. But when they lowered the pavements for wheelchair users to have more mobility, it also improved uh, access and mobility for mothers with pants. So the reality is by making changes and, and doing the work, we improve things across the board. Um, and personalised care is actually for everybody, In I believe, it should be for everybody. Everybody deserves it. Fantastic. Julia, do you have any comment on personalised care? I would I would agree with Beanish. I think when it when people have the time and resources to develop personalised relationships, the care will, will always be safer, in my view. Mm. Um, something that I think, you know, I didn't comment on today, but I think this idea of how we connect with people was a really important one in the project with some people describing excellent connections with people across ethnic groups and it, it came from people who had given them the time and listened mm. perhaps put a hand on an arm at a point where someone felt vulnerable sat down really listened really heard me these were the kind of comments I heard and I think that is you know where, where care is personalized where people are really heard and seen we form connections mm. we have trust we talk care becomes safer mm. no that's I lovely can... Yeah, there as well, Sue. Um, I think, and I'm not sure if I invented it or not, but I think personalised research is really important because um, what Julia and the team have demonstrated there is they've done research in a way that was in response to the wants and the needs of mm. the communities. And it meant that more information came in and you still got the quality of data, which you may not have gotten if you were restricted mm to one standardised version. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's a very strong comment about the quality of the, the research and it being re very real and the real concerns of, of the women and, and families that are concerned. Fantastic. OK, I've got Jill Phillips and it's a comment. Um, and Jill says, hi, Jill, the power balance is such an important issue to recognise right across healthcare. Absolutely. Such an interesting session here. Thank you all. Conversations in a safe space made such a difference, but increasingly hard to people to make the space due to all the pressures. Vicious circle. Actually, absolutely so. And then Juliet Samuel, back to again, Juliet, says amazing presentations. Thank you. What will it take for changes to happen, given the position and challenges within midwifery currently? And the reports seem to highlight the issues that are not addressed in the care provision for parents who've had poor care within. So that's another comment. And then finally, Daniela, she says, and that she was the first one to, to question about how students could get involved. Ah, that's great to hear. My next essay is about creating a QI project. So interesting for this to be my first brain to research. Wow. Hi. Daniela, that's perfect. You finished the circle. You finished the circle. I mean, I was going to ask as a final, this is chair's prerogative. 
about media impact because I think it, it, it hit me with both of you were talking about, you know, what the, the, there's been so much focus on black women, Asian women, they're more likely to have problems, morbidity, mortality in their babies and more likely to. And how do we as practitioners help them not be scared to death? With all that, because some of the media reports really are scary. If you're, you know, just your average mum, whatever an average mum is, if you look at it and you're focused on you and your baby, it must be so scary. Have you got any little pearls of wisdom for us? I'll start with Julia because she'll but have a pearl. You've, <laughs> well, you've you've opened up a can of worms right <laughs> right again. My, so my PhD research was around fetal movement clinicians' perspectives on it and that exact phrase, so we heard a lot, we're scaring the life out of these women. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, this is, and, and in my research interest, you'll see kind of risk work, how we balance risk with um, positive experiences and, and thinking about the unintended effects of raising awareness of risk on anxiety experiences. I think that's really important. Mm. I could say a lot on it. I'm going to say one thing in that I think where we have when we know people well, we have more personalised care, mm. we can read the needs better um, and we can discuss risks in a more balanced, personalised way, which makes it clearer to people where they sit in that, what care they're entitled to. Ideally, we give them that care and that can mitigate a lot of the fear. Um, but I, I agree, I think, you know, the way we, we have a lot of responsibility in how we discuss risk. And I think that is a conversation that needs to to keep happening so we perhaps get better at doing it and Nish. i'm going to uh, come in there too and just say um, and <laughs> our language is really important and uh, julia you know i love you uh but i personally don't like to use the worst word risk because it's the connotations around it and it is a chance it's a one in whatever many chance this may happen or may not happen mm. um and the words we use can actually be coercive um, into making choices and options because we are putting uh, you know a, a negative sometimes inclination or a tone on some mm. of the terminology you know failure to progress and incompetent cervix yeah, I'm words. just I'm, I'm talking mm. about these words that we know we use and they have not been normalized mm. and it's routine and it comes out of our mouth without even thinking <laughs> about it and it's standard and that's the problem standardized and personalized means we respond to the person in front of us. We listen to what they are saying. Listen to understand, not listen to respond. If you understand what the person in front of you is saying, you will absolutely respond to their needs. And your intentions are so important. Making your intentions clear really early on gives someone the ability to trust you and you continuing to come up and do your job and make the effort and make the make the effort to say my name each time even if you're getting it wrong you still try it puts a smile on my face it might give us all <laughs> a laugh it breaks down the tension it breaks the ice but it then shows me the commitment and the investment and therefore it builds trust it builds relationship and we might be running five minutes late but we are we are we, we do that in <laughs> clinic too right we do we do but what and what I should have said because I think that's a, a very important part of we all know we're very busy and you might only have five minutes with the woman but if you say to her I've got five minutes and then you really listen listen I've lost my glasses listen truly not just ticky ticky bops but really listen to what she says that's the most key thing. And five minutes there listening properly is worth an hour not listening at all. So I'm going to say a big, big thank you to Julia and Binish. <laughs> Binish, I've got it, I think, who have been fantastic. And I think we might have to just have a little debate about risk and personalised care. I think this story will continue because it's a, it is a huge issue. But thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise and some of your thoughts to get us thinking about it. So your bedtime reading audience is to get this read. Have a look at the SANS report. It make sure maybe maybe not in the evening before you're about to go to bed because it, it is uncomfortable and it, it's but 
the uncomfortableness will move if you think how you can take that and change your practice and make it better or help other people change their practice because we're all different. So thank you to our lovely guests. Thank you also to Angelo, who's in the background, making sure everything's beautifully recorded and accessible to you afterwards. And thank you to Paul for feeding through the questions. I should have said, because I always look away at my other screen, I should have reminded people that my other screen is where the questions come up. So apologies for looking away from you all. Um, the resources are going to be available on the website. There's going to be a nice podcast at six o'clock in the morning on Friday for those of you who like to go for a run or listen to it on the way to work. Um, we'll see you next week. We've got international midwifery perspectives next week with um, Jacqueline Dunkley Bent and Joy Kemp. Don't forget to book for the London Festival, which is the 6th of February. The All Ireland event is on the 9th of april and leicester festival is 14th of may there's never a dull moment and in the meantime take care and we'll see you next week and thanks to our lovely lovely speakers <laughs>